Good morning. Rise and freedom. I'm Austin Peterson. You're watching and listening to the Wake Up America Show at wakeupamericashow.com. How was everybody's weekend? Wasn't it beautiful? Gosh. I don't know about you, but mid-Missouri yesterday, just all of Easter weekend was absolutely gorgeous here in the Midwest. Hope that you had a good one and you had a nice time with your families, spent some time with your loved ones, or, you know, just got a little bit of rest and relaxation. We're glad and thankful to have you here today. If you're a regular on the show, you know what to do. You got to click that like button. And if it's your first time here today and you're just sitting down and tucking in for a nice breakfast of economic freedom and personal liberty, and you're like, yeah, I kind of like this place. Make sure you click that follow button before you leave your channel today. We'd love to have you come back and join us on the regs, Monday through Friday, 7 to 9 a.m. Central Time. The Wake Up America show streams live from the heart of the United States, the heart of Missouri, Jefferson City. I'm AP. So much exciting news to talk about today. Some good, some bad. Mostly the bad stuff is happening to other people, which, you know, small blessings, I guess. I'm not trying to wish ill will on anybody this morning, but a uh, little bit of good news at the top of this, this show. Let's talk about it. Venezuelan illegal immigrant, Jose Venezuelano, he got captured by ICE. He was the guy who was telling people that uh, they need to invade people's private property and invoke squatters rights so that they could stick around. And we watched a really interesting clip of John Stasso doing an investigative report on that last Friday that was really good. We're gonna to talk to John Miltimore about that this morning at 7.30 a.m. Central Time on the show. Can't wait to hear from John. It's gonna be awesome. Oh yeah. At 7.30 a.m. Central Time, we'll hear from John Miltimore to talk about uh, the illegal immigrant who was caught squat, teaching other people how to squat and take advantage of the American system. Uh, and he is now going to be deported by ICE. Yeah. What's up, mighty Megatron? Yes. Nice to see everybody here. All 92 of you over at rumble.com. And we're also streaming over at x.com as well. Uh, don't forget, you can text the show at 573-319-1586. Again, the text lines are open. And I was getting texts from you guys this weekend, which was really nice. Love to hear from you. Like Andy Opperman was uh, in Kansas City this weekend. And unfortunately, the ramen shop that I recommended to him was closed all weekend. Yikes. Sorry, man. Hopefully you'll get to try it next time you're in KC. Uh, but you can hit me up anytime, just like Andy was. And he was curious about a package that he's waiting on from APforLibertyShop.com, which is in the mail. I sent him his tracking info. So if you ever have questions like that about anything related to the business or the show, that text line is always open. It's a great way for you to communicate to us. So you're just hanging out on a weekend, you're bored, like, what's up, AP? Just send me a text, 573-319-1586. Uh, in other news, at 8 o'clock this morning, we're going to speak to Dr. Rick Becker. Uh, for the very first time, he'll be appearing on the program today to talk about his campaign for the U.S. Senate. He is endorsed by Senator Rand Paul, which is kind of rare to get the big RP endorsement. I'm going to talk to him a little bit about the firing of the former RNC chief, Ron McDaniel Romney, from NBC. I want to talk to, her, talk to him a little bit about uh, Donald Trump's lawfare lawsuits, and we're going to talk to him about illegal immigration uh, from a man who was endorsed by none other than Senator Rand Paul. So I imagine that Dr. Rick Becker is going to be a new guest that you're really going to enjoy. So 8 a.m. Central, you're going to want to come back. If you've got to run some errands or make some breakfast for the kiddos today, don't miss the eight o'clock interview for sure. You shouldn't miss a single minute of the show, but like that one is kind of destination listening for you today, especially because you'll probably want to learn about uh, Dr. Rick Becker because you're going to hear a lot more from him in the mainstream media. Why don't you catch him here first before he goes mainstream? Because, you know, we like the alt media these days and we like to make people famous on the Wake Up America show. There have been quite a few people who have started their careers here and then have gone off to do incredible, amazing, even bigger and better things. Um, at 8.30 a.m. Central Time today, I can't wait to talk to you about the latest big news from down under, no, not Australia, from South America. Javier Malay is going to fire 70,000 government employees. Oh, my God. La buena vida. Hazlo por tu familia. Latinos for Javier Malay. 
Ay, 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 por votos. Ya voy a votar por Javier Malé. La cana mía. Sorry, this song is just such a bop. You know what I'm saying? You know what I'm saying? Uh, so we'll hear at 8.30 o'clock, uh, 8.30 a.m. Central today. We're going to hear from our, our favorite economist on the Javier Malé topic, Aaron Sepulveda. He's going to join us at 8.30 a.m. Central to talk about Javier Malay firing 70,000 government employees. The funniest comment that I saw on this over the weekend when people were talking about um, or bragging, you Argentines, when the Argentines were bragging about their uh, president firing 70,000 employees, the funniest response that I saw to that was, oh, yeah, well, our transportation secretary is gay. Mm -hmm. Hazlo por tu familia, Latinos por Donald Trump. Ay, 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 sa, sa. Ay, ya voy a votar por Donald Trump. Ay, ya por farosaria, ya Latinos por Donald Trump. Okay, so, great show, uh, great content, great guest for you today. And we have an exciting new announcement to make. Are you guys ready? This is when you get up early and you actually join us in the, for like the very first part of the show, you get to hear like exciting stuff first, which is why it's a good idea for you to be here with us early. So here's the deal. You are the first to hear it right now. The exciting new launch of a brand new show as part of our network, and that is Hustling and Homemaking, starring Steffi P for Liberty. Uh, so uh, congratulations to Stephanie Peterson. It's been a four year hiatus since she was making videos. She used to make videos when she lived in Michigan before we were together and she would do like cooking videos, baking videos, talking about uh, book reviews and things. Well, that's coming back with a vengeance with a little twist. Now, of course, she is a pregnant first-time mom and a homemaker, and she has a little um, she has a little career on the side. So, congratulations to Stephanie Peterson on the brand new launch of her exciting show, Hustling and Homemaking, starting today. Ya voy a votar por Donald Trump. La economía. Hustling and homemaking sounds fun, says Quantum Kitty. That's because it is going to be fun. The brand new show. Hustling and Homemaking launches today, right after the Wake Up America show ends. So at 9.05 a.m. Central Time, you're going to be able to watch Stephanie's first episode of her brand new show. It's not a live show. It's a pre-recorded show. So <clears throat> it's one that we put together a lot of work in. And starting today, you will be able to see the, the first episode starting at 9.05 a.m. Central Time. If you're going to be looking for the new show, Hustling and Homemaking, where is it going to be? Right now, it's only going to exist on our YouTube channel that we have plans to bring it to other networks uh, once we can uh, appropriately ensure that everything is, is kosher. So um, if you want to find the video, as soon as the show is over today, head to ap4libertyshop.com where you'll see the announcement at the very top of the website this morning. As a matter of fact, if you go over there right now, you'll be able to see the announcement, although you won't be able to see the show itself just yet. She's got a brand new logo for it. Um, this is not the exact logo, but it's a variation of it. Then you can see here the lovely Steffi. This is a variation of her logo. See the little cute little red-haired baby there? Isn't that cute? Isn't that nice? Uh, you can see Hustling and Homemaking, new show launching today, featuring her stories balancing pregnancy, motherhood, homemaking, and keeping a career on the side. So you can follow along with her adventures in Hustling and homemaking so you can click here to watch it'll take you to the video it premieres in 113 minutes give it up for steffi liberty shindig says so all you need to do to get your own show is have ap's baby yes There you go. So 9.05 a.m. today. If you guys want to watch the new show, you can do so. Just make sure you visit ap4libertyshop.com. And as usual, we have bonus content available for you to unlock. Did you think I was going to not do the extra work? I did the extra homework. I made it available to you. Now, whenever we get the bonus content on the first day of the week, uh, I like to not even let slip the themes of war. You don't even know what the theme is until you unlock the first bonus content episode today. What, Austin, what is, this is my first time watching the Like of America show. 
What is the bonus content? Well, the bonus content are many documentaries that I produce for you available to unlock during the course of the live show. So if you're tuning in this morning live for the first time and you're like, I want to unlock the bonus content, I want to see what this week's theme is, you have to either make a Rumble Rant donation, a YouTube uh, uh, super chat, or a uh, make a purchase at apforlibertyshop.com. And if we make at least $50 by the end of the show, either in purchases or in donations, then you will unlock today's bonus content. In order to find out what the theme of this week is, you have to unlock today's. Now, if we don't unlock today's, then the mini documentary that I produced goes away forever and no one ever gets to see it. So there is your incentive. You don't want to have that happen. Yes, it will happen. It hasn't happened yet. And we've been doing this for almost two months now, which is absolutely incredible. Thank you to all your uh, for all of our support. Uh, but if you want to unlock today's bonus content, you can do that at AP, the number four, AP for Liberty shop.com. Someone says no tips on X. I have no idea if you can. I don't think you can do tips on X. But if you're going to do something like that, best way to do it is just visit the website, wakeupamericashow.com slash support. Uh, and you can make a donation over there just like a regular tip. Levin214 kicks it off with 20 in the tip jar. He wants to see the bonus content. Thank you, Levin. Yavo, yavo, ta, poor Donald Trump. Poor Donald Trump. Okay, let's get to the news. I know you guys are eager to hear what's going on in the world. Before we talk about the uh, squatters, the illegal immigrant who was arrested, we're going to talk about the squatters. Uh, I've got a couple of clips that I want to play for you. Some uh, A Joe Rogan clip that was going viral over the weekend. Take a listen to this. Well, I would vote for Trump before I'd vote for Biden, just because I think with Biden, like he's no, he's he's gone. Like you know, he's gone. It's you're gonna be relying on his cabinet, and I knew his cabinet would be this fucking sideshow of diversity. Sorry, I'm bad language. And which is exactly what it is. You can't have those kind of people running a Ben and Jerry's. You <laughs> you certainly can't have those kind of people running the fucking most powerful government the world's ever known. <laughs> Give it up for Joe Rogan. And he's not like, he's not a conservative. I mean, Joe Rogan has, you know, he used to be a big Bernie Sanders supporter. I mean, it, it's amazing how more people are starting to kind of break out of the sort of binary thinking when it comes to the two political parties. And, and if you really think about Donald Trump and who he is and what he represents, in in my opinion, I think Donald Trump has the qualities of a third party candidate like an RFK Jr., because he is much more independent. He's not wedded to the Republican Party establishment the way that so many of the other candidates have been in the past. I mean, he has his own empire, his own business empire that he's built on his own. And I think that that's probably one of the reasons why someone like Joe Rogan would be more attracted to a Donald Trump versus like, oh, like a Mitt Romney. I mean, can you see a Joe Rogan voting for a Mitt Romney? Like, that, do that doesn't make any sense. But you know, the more that I, you know, get embedded in the Republican Party myself here in the state of Missouri, and the more I meet my fellow Republicans. And the other day, I saw my friend uh, Jamie Pearson in the parking lot, and uh, she's a big, you know, uh, Governor Bill Igel supporter here. She well, a candidate. Uh, he's a senator now, but he's running for governor. Bill Igel, and she's wearing her hat. And I saw her with my wife in the High V parking lot, and we're chatting about politics and who's running for this and. The talking about the upcoming delegation this weekend, the more I really start to like the people who are in my community who are trying to make a change. For, and, and, you know, there are different factions in the Republican Party. They're, not everybody is like me, like just solely devoted mostly to limited government, right? You know, other people are more concerned about like faith-based issues or family-based issues. Um, and and I, really, I really kind of like this coalition of people that uh, have been brought together for supporting Donald Trump. And you know, when I see videos like these, I know that they're they're designed to kind of tug at the heartstrings. But when I see videos like these of Donald Trump talking, you know, giving this kind of a motivational speech, it, it makes me a little bit more proud of my upcoming vote for Donald Trump. Never, ever quit. Never quit. I don't know if it's an ability or if you have it. Just you can't quit. And I've seen people quitting. And if they would have held out longer, they would have been successful. I've seen it so much. I've seen some of the most brilliant people in the world that never made it because they were quitters. They were just quitters. They would quit. They would, they just couldn't take it. They couldn't, whatever. One of the things about loving what you do is that it's not work and therefore you don't quit automatically. It's a lot easier not to quit. But you can never give up. Now, you have to also have flexibility though. 
you can't necessarily say, I'm never giving up, I'm going to, and you got to be able to weave and bob. You don't have to go through a, a concrete wall when you can go over it or around it or under it or something. You have to kind of an ironic statement there <laughs> have flexibility you have to yeah. always be able to change course a little bit maybe always with that same goal but don't you know and I, and I think about that you know too in my uh, political career you know starting out as a hardcore you know libertarian party activist um i would just say i, I would just say that you know, there there is a true wisdom in what donald trump is talking about here like being able to to bob and weave like like not being a quitter but also being able to shuck and jive and move around a little bit and have a, and have some flexibility. I mean, I, I just really I felt all very motivated this weekend, you know, for the upcoming caucus here in the state of Missouri. I'm excited to participate in it and to help to shape the future of the Republican Party in my state. And, you know, I see so many people who are like me, who are, you know, who are upset at the system, who, you know, want to try and work change from outside of the system. And, you know, I bless them. I wish them well. And I think that there are, you know, many good people in my former political party that they mean well and they we share a lot of the same values. But if you've been thinking about, like Spike Cohen joked on my show last week, if you've been thinking about making a change, if you've been thinking about actually getting involved in, in a political party where you can make a difference, if especially if you're in a red state, and maybe even if you're in a blue state, you can help to reform that. They probably need you even more in the blue states, honestly. Um, if you would just uh, consider joining your local Republican club, honestly, I, I I feel like I'm already starting to make a difference and I'm excited about it and I don't plan on quitting. But if something, if I do run into a wall, then I potentially could, you know, have to, you know, move a little bit, right? So like I was running into a wall with the Libertarian Party in 2016, 2017, and I was like, okay, I still believe the same principles, but I can't just continue to keep running into a wall. Like the people who agree with me on my political principles should not be my primary enemies, right? The people who I am fighting against full time should not be the people that I'm agreeing with on 90 to 95% of the issues, right? That's the reality. Okay. It, that's what you, what you face when you're a member of the libertarian party, you will face the majority of your time fighting with people that you agree with on 90 to 95% of the issues. That is a humongous waste of your time. Now, if I'm disagreeing with people or I'm working to try and advance policy here in the state of Missouri, you know, I'm, I'm actually changing hearts and minds towards my ideas because people are just a little bit more flexible uh, in when they operate within the two parties. This has just been my example, but I wonder what you think about it. You can weigh in and I'm sure your experience might be very different. Quantum Kitty donated $5, says good luck with Steffi's new show. Thank you. Look on a Mia, por familia. Uh, and if you've got something to say on this or anything else, send us a text at 573-319-1586. Again, the text lines are open at 573-319-1586. Uh, Quantum is saying, am I showing up with a double rant? Yeah, that's a glitch. It doesn't actually send twice. It just shows twice. So if you make a Rumble rant donation on the show, just FYI. You don't get charged twice. You can double check your your statement, and you'll you'll see that I'm correct. But it does sometimes just show it as twice, like Levin two one four, for example. So, anyways, Urs mommy's got to go. No, she says my contractor needs me to look at something for my new office. Have a great day, all. We'll miss you. Bye. Hope you'll come back tomorrow. Latinos for Donald Trump. All right, so let's see. We got ten minutes until John Miltimore comes. I just got a, a quick little story I was reading on the Wall Street Journal this weekend that um, that I thought was worthy of mentioning. You know, I used to work in talk radio, uh, and I saw this news article headline, coming soon, an AM radio mandate, just what the country needs to raise the price of electric vehicles, Grace. So this is a, um, an op-ed from the Wall Street Journal's editorial board about the proposal for a mandate that all new vehicles, including electric vehicles, include AM radios in them. So some automakers have dropped AM radio from electric vehicle models because their components can actually interfere with signals. So the companies can mitigate electromagnetic interference with cables, filters, and other materials, but those involve actual engineering trade-offs 
that will increase manufacturing costs of the electric vehicles, of course, but uh, they don't care. Congress, of course, wants to mandate old fashioned analog AM as a quote, safety feature similar to seatbelts and airbags. Um, and of course, President Biden is moving forward with his electric vehicle mandate, and that would basically require all new vehicles sold in the U.S. to include devices that can receive signals and play content transmitted by AM broadcast. So the left wants to mandate the electric vehicle. The right wants to mandate the AM stay, um, radio in the vehicle. So they want to increase the costs to the taxpayers from the left, and they want to increase the cost to the consumers from the right. So basically, that's how you get screwed by both sides. It's just quite annoying. Uh, and AM broadcasters, they're, you know, of course, they're competing with people like myself, you know, satellite radio, other uh, forms of audio media. And AM broadcasters, which I used to be, right, they say that AM radio can provide the only reliable source of information in an emergency. And while it's true that AM signals can reach rural locations where cell service and broadband can sometimes be limited, people are, if you're able to get a cell phone signal, then you're going to be able to get emergency alerts. I mean, who? there are very few people in the United States who live in an area where not only can they, where the only form of communication that gets to their home is AM radio signals. Probably not the type of people that are going to be having to worry so much about emergency signals. It doesn't happen, sure, maybe a tornado here or there, but that's exceedingly rare. But of course, they want to they want to socialize the costs onto people like us. And I remember, you know, towards the tail end of my radio career uh, a couple of years ago, that this this talk about the AM radio push was coming on. And of course, the big wigs at the radio stations are all like, oh, yeah, absolutely. You know, I mean, does it you, conservative is as, as all get out, right? Limited government, cut spending, cut taxes. We like limited government. Libertarians are cool. Yeah. Donald Trump, right? Right wing Republicans, right? But then when it comes to that, Everybody, when it comes to their industry, is a socialist. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? So at, it, at the end, like, you know, of my, as I was kind of like, you know, heading towards the exits of, uh, of radio and to move into podcasting now, uh, I, they were all pushing this radio mandate. And I'm just like, God, I'm glad that I'm leaving because I would not want to. Can you imagine? You don't really get. You don't really get in in all cases to have free speech <laughs> things like that i mean i mean can you imagine I, I mean the imagine the moral quandary that someone who's like a conservative radio host would be in where your boss i mean and it's your industry it's your own job too right you're concerned about the am radio industry potential and, and all the competition that's coming from guys like me and others who are trying to eat their lunch take their advertisers take their airtime get the attention from people um you can imagine that, you know, the big wigs that, you know, they want to protect their jobs, right? So these AM radio mandates are, they're going to tell people like Ted Cruz and, and Marco Rubio and they're from, you know, who they talk to all the time on their local radio stations who come in to, to talk on their conservative talk radio. They're going to tell them, yeah, we want an AM radio mandate because that's going to protect our jobs. But then imagine that you're like, imagine you're actually principled and you don't support it. What do you do? Because your boss is definitely going to support it. Your boss is going to tell you to support it. And this is this is how you know, like the media. It's it, this is how like the corruption kind of begins in the media. And let's I'm not pretend. Let's not pretend that it, the corruption doesn't exist. Of course, in the mainstream media, which is of course rife with corruption and is it totally dominated ninety eight percent by leftists. Of course, it is. You know, I, I'm speaking to this because this has been my experience in, in conservative talk radio. I can tell you that you know, at being a radio show host. At this point in time, being a, like an actual limited government conservative, not just some crony, I want to be close to politicians and be friends with them and get close to them so I can get interviews with them. And I, and I talk a big game about limited government, but I don't really give a crap because at the end of the day, what I really care about is protecting my job. Um, that's all in air quotes, by the way. That's not me speaking. That's the, you know, the BS fake conservative on, on talk radio. Can you imagine being in that situation? Then your boss tells you you've got to support this AM radio mandate. That would not be fun. And that is why I am so glad to be on the Wake Up America show, totally free, totally independent, hosting my own shows. I don't have to lobby Congress. All I have to do is defend what I believe in and say what I feel, say what I mean, 
launched new shows like Steffi's Hustling and Homemaking. Let's talk about that Venezuelan squatter, that illegal immigrant who got arrested by ICE. Talk about the problem of squatting and illegal immigration. When we get back on the Wake Up America show at wakeupamericashow.com. Expanse of time, a year might seem like a mere moment, but oh, what a year it's been. In September 2022, Austin and Stephanie Peterson embarked on a journey, a journey to wake up America. They began humbly with just 20 souls tuning in, learning, listening, and though challenges arose, like the looming shadow of YouTube demonetization, their spirit never waned. And now, thanks to you, thousands rise with the sun to join them, to listen, to engage engage to be a part of a community so here's to you and to wake up america for memories shared for friends made for the journey ahead and for never ever forgetting to rise and freedom happy anniversary i'm donald Trump, and i approve this message believe me austin peterson is the best he's got the greatest wake up america show i've ever seen whenever i tune in in the mornings and watch the live stream let me tell you, he has got the absolute best content. I love his guests. It's just a total blast to watch. And I highly endorse and recommend the Wake Up America show. It's terrific. Believe me. Is the outdoor your home about as exciting as a library? Then spice it up and unbore your space with our custom metal signs. Crafted with love and a bit of libertarian magic, you can customize your own metal sign at ap4libertyshop.com. So head to ap4libertyshop.com, customize your own metal sign today. to a world of vocal discovery at Peterson Voice Studio. I'm Justin Peterson, here to guide your musical journey. Envision a place where your voice reaches new heights, where every note tells a story. We embrace all singers, from the enthusiastic shower vocalists to aspiring stars, ensuring each voice finds its unique rhythm and tone. Are you ready to elevate your voice? Visit petersonvoicestudio.com and sign up for remote lessons tailored just for you. Let's begin this melodious journey together. Tired of spending your hard-earned money on woke corporations that don't share your pro-freedom values? Fed up with sipping liberal lattes and progressive cappuccinos? Introducing Founding Flavors from AP for Liberty Shop. Get your day started with Washington's revolutionary roast. As robust and principled as the man himself, this blend is the shot of energy heard round the world. Or maybe you want to taste the fervor of freedom with Adams's patriotic perk. It's as dynamic and balanced as the U.S. Constitution, sure to awaken your spirit of liberty. For the aficionados, we've got the Jeffersonian Java, a complex mix of flavors that speaks volumes about your refined tastes. And don't forget Betsy's Liberty Lullaby, our decaf option. Crafted with the same care and dedication Betsy Ross put into our star-spangled banner, this blend lets you enjoy the taste of freedom anytime without losing sleep. No woke beans here, folks. Just pure, patriotic. Patriotic, pro-freedom flavors brewed with love for liberty. So why compromise your principles for a cup of coffee? Stand up for your values, perk up your patriotism, and start your day the American way. Get your founding flavors at apforlibertyshop.com. Que si una casa 
no está habitada, podemos expropiarla. Capichi, muchachos, House aquí is not en Yunei State. Accommodated, then invaded. Good morning. Rise in freedom. I'm Austin Peterson. You're watching and listening to the Wake Up America show at wakeupamericashow.com. We're glad and thankful to have you here. Make sure you click that like button. Subscribe to the channel. If it's your first time watching the Wake Up America show, we'd love to have you come back here and join us on the regs. Don't forget, too, that the brand new show as part of the Wake Up America network launches today. Stephanie's Hustling and Homemaking brand new show launches today at ap4libertyshop.com right after the show's over today at 9.05 a.m make sure you head immediately over to ap4libertyshop.com so you can see the launch of stephanie peterson's brand new hustling and homemaking show featuring her stories ba balancing pregnancy motherhood homemaking and keeping a career on the side follow along with her adventures in hustling and homemaking launching today at ap4libertyshop.com well it's a lot harder to keep a home if you can't live in it if you've got people flooding across the southern border and breaking into your homes and declaring squatters rights well the person that you just saw in that video got arrested yes migrant influencer <laughs> we would have had no idea what that was 10 years ago Lionel moreno waves around cash in his videos he's mocking u.s taxpayers people like you and me you know who work like slaves after he urged fellow illegals to become squatters in U.S. homes. It's become such a huge problem in the United States. John Stossel devoted a whole episode to it in his last video, and we're going to talk about it now with a man who knows a thing or two about economics and limited government. His name is John Miltimore. He's the editor at large of the Foundation for Economic Education. It's Mondays with Miltimore. He's joining us live now. Good morning, John. Hey, good morning, AP. How's it going today? Going good, bud. Thanks so much for joining us here today. So have you seen the video of this guy screaming into the camera and waving his $100 bills? In I just weeks. watched it like a half hour ago. What's your take? Well, you know, I'm going to take sort of the counter take on this. I think we owe this guy a huge thanks, right? Like nobody was talking about, you know, these squatters, you know, before this. I know there was like one vi video that was going viral in New York. But if you really wanted to see how insane some of, you know, so, some of this stuff is, you know, this guy has really raised this as an issue. Now, I'm not saying we should literally thank him for it. Like he's, you know, clearly what he's doing is wrong. But if you look like there's never been if if you take property rights seriously, this should really piss you off. Right. And we see people, you know, I couldn't have told you what squatters rights were, you know, a month ago. Um, but it's way more common than anyone realizes. You look at the statistics in New York or Georgia or some of these other states. What you have are people they just move into houses. And they have legal protections once they've been there for 30 days. Like, let's say you went away on a family vacation. Let's say, say you're taking care of a sick parent. You come back, you have people in your house. They have rights to your home. You cannot you cannot make them move. If you try to, to, to wait till they leave and you change the locks, you go to jail. So this is, you know, completely insane. Um, and, you know, th this guy recognized, you know, what was happening and started to educate other people like, hey, we can just go over here and just start moving into homes. Um, it's really raised the profile of what's going on. And you have states now taking action because of it. You know, Ron DeSantis in Florida passed, you know, I think just signed legislation, if I read it correctly. Georgia, there's a bill moving there. Even in New York, an assemblyman has, has uh, introduced legislation there that's going to, you know, make this um, illegal and, and give, you know, homeowners more rights. So th this could, out, could turn out to be a, a huge win for property owners. Um, and these laws really, you know, that give people who have no legal right to a home that give them rights. Um, it, it's really crazy stuff. Yeah, John. Uh, now, squatting has been something that's existed for quite some time. I mean, and, and it was the kind of thing that you might have heard on a local news report from time to time. Oh, this guy's, you know, a landlord and he's got problems with squatting. But there's been the kind of this ideological push in the last couple of decades with the woke left uh, against landlords. You'll, you'll see it quite frequently, memes and, and reels and short videos going around where they're you know dissing on landlords hating on landlords saying that landlords provide no value no service to society or what 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 have you and then coincidentally now we have this massive push of illegal immigrant Im immigration in the country and a massive push by squatters it does seem as if this has been something that the left has been working towards for quite some time is that too conspiratorial i don't think so no i think there are two components here i think one is like i think 
the left does despise pop property rights, right? And that that hostility toward landlords that you talk about is rooted in that. And then if you go back to squatters' rights, a little I've I've looked at this issue, which is not much until like the last week or so. Um, there are just old bills in states that might not be rooted in ideology, but just say like you if you look at squatting years ago, it wasn't people intentionally going in to homes, breaking in, rooting down. What it was was somebody took shelter during a, a hurricane or something and they're there and then they let I that was the genesis of some of those some of that legislation. But yes, it, it, it's absolutely rooted in a hostility towards property rights. And I think you know when when you marry that to sort of like the, this idea of just, you know, of, of people pouring into the country and using this to to stick it to property owners and landlords and things. There is very much an ideological component to this. If you're just tuning into the Wake Up America show, good morning. I'm Austin Peterson. We're glad and thankful to have you here. Please do click that like and follow the channel. If you're watching us on x.com this morning, as I imagine, oh, several hundred of you might be, about 500 people watching us live over there. Good morning. Do us a favor and click repost with the stream so that more people can get it in their timeline. We'd love to be able to have you share the ideas of economic freedom and personal liberty uh, with more of your friends. And we'd like to continue to grow this channel. We appreciate you very much. I'm speaking to John Miltimore, the editor at large of the Foundation for Economic Education about a squatter, an illegal squatter who became this celebrity online, John. He had like half a million followers on TikTok before he finally had his account shut down. I would have thought that TikTok would have wanted to allow this guy to remain on their platform because it sort of it fits along with like the ideological coverage that we're hearing about the Chinese communists wanting to take down American society. But maybe TikTok is getting a little bit more squirrely these days because of the House bill that passed to force to divest. Um, so it does seem as if there is a little bit of fear that maybe the left has gone a little bit too far this time. I mean, this guy was, you know, just begging to get arrested. I got a video of him up right now with his, like, he's got snot running down his nose and he's holding, holding up his baby. Please, please, please don't send me back. Don't send me back. Boy, they realize just how good they got it here once they have to go back home. Uh, it just reminds you of, you know, how ungrateful the left and so many people in this country are to live in one of the greatest, freest, most prosperous nations on earth, doesn't it? You know, it, it's funny you talk about his account getting shut down. And I was looking at this, I was wondering, you know, it, it, like people like you and I, we believe in free speech, right? And, and I was wondering, like, oh, how is how is TikTok going to handle this? I'm not surprised they cracked down. Um, but let's look, the, the guy was using the platform kind of like it's intended to be used. And, and he was, you know, getting massive views. But I did think they were going to crack down on him. And here's why. He was I making the you. government look really stupid and impotent. And they weren't going to like that. So I think a lot of pressure came down on TikTok to take action on this one. Um, and, you know, it, you had two really massive political issues here. You had immigration, which has already got people very, you know, stirred up. And then you have people's property, their homes. So th so this had everything. There's a reason this story is is going, you know, bonkers. Um, I will say it did bring, you know, I think some needed attention to immigration policy. Like this is a thorny issue, you know, like like especially among libertarians on, on what should be the policy. But I, I don't care if you're an open borders libertarian or one that, you know, feels like we should have more, you know, actually have a border. What we're seeing is is border insanity. Because what we're seeing is here's what we're gonna do. We have migrants coming through the border and we're going to stop you. We are going to tell you that you're an unlawful person. We're gonna release you into the country, which is what happened to him. Um, and to me, that seems like all, what you're creating is a massive bureaucracy of paperwork. You, you, you don't, like the virtue of open borders would be, hey, you, we don't have to worry. We're just gonna be a free society, be people come and go. Um, but you don't even get that with this. What you get is like people are pouring in, but then you have a massive bureaucracy that has to deal with these people. Um, and, and they're sort of being tracked. It's kind of like, look how fa fast they found this guy. Once like, he had been in the States for, for at least two years, I think. He, 2022 is when he was processed. And they got him real quick when they needed to. Um, so I think it does bring some much needed attention to like the, the U.S. immigration policy. However you think it should be, it's utterly broken.
you know, obviously, I, I don't like the way he described that, like this idea, like, oh, if you're born here, you can milk the country for all of this. Uh, so that to me is something I that mentality really bothers me. I do think the American approach, if you're born in this country, you're a citizen. I, th I think that that is a, a sound thing. I, I don't think that's something that we need to change. Uh um, obviously, like there is this component, if you have pregnant mothers just trying to get across borders and having babies there, like there's a lot of problems that, with that, including the health of a mother. I don't want a mother trying to race across a border to give birth on U.S. soil so her, you know, her, her, her children you know, is a U.S. citizen. Um, but I am comfortable with that. You know, like it, it, I, I was born here. I was automatically a U.S. citizen. I think if, if anyone born here, you know, if you are born here, this, you, you United a States? U.S. citizen. But isn't the United States like the only country in the world that does that? I mean, in theory, shouldn't you have to have like be born of at least one of your parents being, uh, um, you know, one of your parents should be of the nationality of which your child would be born with. I mean, if if we can, if I moved to Germany or if I if I traveled to Germany and I, I had a child in Germany, that child wouldn't be a German that child would be an American, right? Because they're from, they're, they're from my blood and that's my nationality. Like, isn't it probably wiser to disincentivize anchor babies? Because like you said, we're in, if women know that they can come here and have a child and then that child is an American citizen, you're actually incentivizing mothers to take that dangerous trip, aren't you? No, there, there is an incentive there to be considered. And you're not wrong that we're kind of, you know, the United States is unique in this policy, um, that we're, we're, we're different. But there's a lot of things about America that are unique. And I think, you know, that, that make America exceptional. Um, I, you know, the concerns you raise are, are, are legitimate. I can't say Thank I you. feel strongly about this issue um, or, or that I've even thought about it that much. But to me, I do like the simplicity of it. Hey, you're here. You, you're a citizen. What your parents were doesn't really matter. There is something about the American ethos about that. We don't care where you came from. You you were born here, and, and, and now now you can live here and, and and prosper like anyone else. I like that clean, you know, simple rule. Um, you know, don't you think that there needs to be some border security here on the southern border? I mean, as much as we want to be a welcoming nation and have people come to, the, you know, be incentivized to come to the United States for the right reasons, we still need to have some semblance of border security. What does that look like to somebody like yourself? Well, you know, to me, this is one of the trickiest issues. I think about this. I want to live in a country where you have free movement. That means allowing people to come and go, even people from other countries. But there are obvious problems, you know, with that approach when you have um, entitlements in a country. This isn't new to libertarians. They've been writing about this for a lot of years. You know, I think Murray Rothbard had, had you know, even a change of heart at some point on this issue. Um, and so I, I do think that having a process better than we have now is good. Like I said, today we have the, the, the worst of both worlds. We have a massive uh border patrol agency and dhs that is it has all these people coming through in a massive yes. bureaucracy tracking people and then we release you into the country um it makes no sense um i i am you know it's an issue i've, I've thought a lot about like, like i i I've, I've become more of an open border proponent th than i was you know probably five or six years um and i think there are even benefits to that even you look at the headaches that you have migrants you know that are being encouraged to come here and uh, squat in houses, right? Like that, that, that terrified people. It actually, you know, is making us appreciate property rights a little bit more and, and, and encouraging states to take, um, you know, advanced legislation that is going to actually improve those things. So there's some good things. Um, but I, I'll, I'll just fall on our, our immigration policy is utterly broken. I don't think Democrats have a solution for it. I don't think Republicans have a solution for it. And the truth is, Austin, I haven't said this yet, but I'm not sure libertarians have a solution for it either. It's an extremely complicated issue and complicated issues are, are ones that we're not very good at solving right now. Like we, what, we, what you have is a lot of people that end up shouting at each other. Um, but I think we can all agree the current situation is broken and maybe that's a place to start. Let's admit the situation is utterly broken. Over the weekend, I heard some prominent libertarian podcasters we're saying that we need to deploy the military on the southern border to protect our southern border. What would you think about that? If we brought all the troops home from overseas and put them on the southern border to protect our nation's border, how would you feel about that? 
I would I would really hate that. I, I think this is the wrong approach. I don't think we really want to. I'm not even going to entertain an idea like that. There's there's a lot better solutions to me. Let's say you do think borders are really, really important. There's a lot better solutions here than deploying the U.S. military to the border. There are, you know, but you, you need to get, you know, some political agreement on that. We first need to realize, hey, you know what? We, we do think this is a high priority. Let, let's start. Let, let's not forget. At one point, okay, but, this was a high priority. We have all of these fences and and, and so right, forth. But John, but we're don't just you, not use, using. What them. about the National Guard? I mean, Texas wants to deploy their own police officers and the National Guard of Texas onto the border to protect the border of their state. Do you have a problem with that? No, I, I think that's within Texas's right to do that. This is a you know, and I, I'm glad the Supreme Court you know came down on this. Uh, I think that's the proper. You know, and there's always been a bit of a struggle here between the federal government and states' rights. But if Texas wants to take an approach like that, and and what's going to happen? You're going to see other. You know, I, I'm guessing you're going to see migrants come through other places, and then you're going to see you know whether it's private landowners or other states that say, okay, either we like this or we don't. Um, and if we don't, um, we're going to have to do something about it. Um, I think the one thing we've learned, the federal government has, has really botched this, right? Like this is the, this is the thing. W the federal government won the political war. They said, no, we have the right to do on immigration. They've been fighting for it for a long time. They they really did screw it up in in, in, a, in a massive way. They can't seem to figure out if they want to, you know, have a, have a closed border, an open border. Um, so we have pure chaos down there. Mm. My friend Kilsharian sent me a text message this morning. She was just correcting one of the things I said. She said. Um, the USA isn't alone in allowing citizenship to those born here. The UK gives citizenship to those born in the UK. Her son is a prime example. Thank you, Kilsharian. I thought that there was maybe one or two other countries, but I know it's it, it's uh, it's a bigger deal, of course, in the United States, where more people want to move uh, than the UK. The weather is not so hot, but uh, we appreciate that, uh, Kilsharian. Thank you very much. Um, John, is there anything else on this topic, the squatters topic, the illegal immigration topic, or anything that in particular you'd like to share before we let you go today, friend? Uh, not really, no. Just check out uh, our content on fee.org, and I'm on Substack, and, and look me up. I'm at the, the Take by John Miltimore. There we go, The Take by John Miltimore. Hey, John, we always appreciate the fact that you join us on Mondays, Mondays with Miltimore, and you get up so early here to be able to join us, and you're so generous with your time. Thank you for that. Appreciate you very hey. much. No, thanks for the invite, AP. I appreciate you. Yep, have a good one. John Miltimore, ladies and gents. Always appreciate his point of view on things. And sometimes we tussle and go back and forth on things, but John's a, a pretty good uh, thought leader in the Liberty Movement. If you're enjoying the content today, don't forget to click that like button if you haven't already. And for those of you who are joining us for the very first time, make sure that you click follow as well. You want to find us here on the Wake Up America show Mondays through Fridays from 7 to 9 a.m. Central Time. That's the show schedule. So if you enjoy the content, you want to make a regular thing out of it, that is the show schedule. Congratulations to you, the viewer and listener, because we've unlocked the bonus content today. Appreciate you. It means that you now get to find out what is the theme of the show this week. So um, the theme of the bonus content this week is going to be Guns That Won, the top five... Guns, rifles, machine guns that won the American Republic. Today, you're going to get a bonus video uh, that will talk about one of the most important guns in American history that helped to win the American Republic. And each day this week, we will produce a mini documentary that you can unlock. Uh, thank you very much to our friends who have contributed this morning through Rumble Rant donations and through purchases at apforlibertyshop.com. You are now going to get to enjoy that bonus content. And then we'll play some brief little commercials. And then when we get back, Dr. Rick Becker, endorsed by Senator Rand Paul, running for U.S. Senate. He's going to join us live on the show for the very first time ever. We'll ask him about the immigration stuff. We'll talk to him about Ronna McDaniel Romney getting fired by NBC. Get his take on that. Very liberty-leaning, hopefully, U.S. Senator coming up here in less than 10 on the Wake Up America show at wakeupamericashow.com. Bonus content for the Wake Up America show is The Guns That Won, featuring the five greatest weapons that helped to build the American Republic. Part one, the Kentucky Rifle. Today we examine the little known history of the Kentucky Rifle, a pivotal yet almost forgotten implement that played a significant role in the early days of the United States. The Kentucky Rifle, 
a crucial tool in winning the North American continent, was indispensable during the migration westward. This mass movement, driven by various factors including the search for new land, shaped the early American frontier. Calling it a rifle, however, may be a misnomer since the initial version was smoothbore and not rifled. The westward migration followed well-defined routes, with one passing through Lancaster, Pennsylvania. Here, the stage was set for the birth of a unique firearm, influenced by German and Swiss settlers. Rifling technology, believed to have originated in Central Europe, was refined by these settlers to meet the harsh requirements of the American frontier. The early European rifles were unsuitable for frontier life, prompting local gunsmiths to innovate. They created a lighter, more reliable and accurate rifle, which became indispensable for survival in the wilderness. By 1721, an unnamed gunsmith crafted a new flintlock rifle, marking a significant advancement in firearms technology. This rifle was designed with an emphasis on accuracy, ease of loading, and durability. The Lancaster rifle, developed around 1739, evolved into what is known today as the Kentucky rifle. This firearm was distinguished by its craftsmanship, accuracy, and unique design features. The Kentucky rifle's effectiveness was greatly enhanced by the invention of the patch, which increased accuracy and made loading easier. This innovation was a key factor in the rifle's superiority. Loading the Kentucky rifle was a meticulous process that involved several steps, ensuring the weapon's reliability and performance. Over time, the rifle underwent modifications to maintain accuracy, including re-rifling and adjustments to bullet molds. The Kentucky rifle reached its peak development by 1760 with the introduction of the set or hair trigger, further improving its accuracy. During its heyday, the Kentucky rifle was not only a practical tool, but also a work of art, adorned with intricate decorations and inlays. The Kentucky Rifle's legacy is a testament to the ingenuity and resourcefulness of early American settlers. It was not just a weapon, but a symbol of survival and determination. Today, the Kentucky Rifle stands as a historical artifact, representing a pivotal era in American history and the challenges faced by those who dared to venture into the unknown. In closing, the story of the Kentucky Rifle is a fascinating chapter in American history reflecting the spirit of innovation and the relentless pursuit of progress that defined the early years of the United States. Want an engaging website to boost your business? You're just a click away from five-star Fiverr talent. Hundreds of freelancer skills like web design. Head to Fiverr.com today and get something started. American conservatism is distinct, like America is distinct from the United Kingdom. American conservatism's roots comes out of the Wild West, out of pioneerism. The difference between American conservatives and European conservatives is that Americans are cowboys. We are that God, guns, gold, and girls. It's wild here. And we should stay that way. We shouldn't allow a European version of conservatism to come and infect us here. We like it wide open spaces here, you know, deep in the heart of Texas and all that. Hey there, it's your favorite Vice President Joe Biden. I wanted to talk to you today about the Wake Up America show, the best source for all your political news and commentary. But before I get started, let me just make sure I have all my notes in, in order. Yeah. Okay. okay, where was I? All oh, right, the Wake Up America show. It's a great way to stay informed and make your voice heard. Boy, what was I saying again? All oh, right, right, right. The Wake Up America show. It's important that we all stay engaged and knowledgeable about um, what's going on in our country and, uh, you know, the thing. But how long where was I going with all this? Oh, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. The Wake Up America show. It, it's a fantastic resource. And if you really want to make a difference, man, you can sign up to be a monthly donor at wakeupamericashow.com slash support. Now, uh, where was I? Um. Oh, that's right. The Wake Up America Show. So if you want to stay woke and support a great cause, 
Head on over to wakeupamericashow.com slash support and sign up to be a monthly donor today. And if you're feeling generous, you can even give a donation in my name. Thanks for listening and keep on keeping on, America. Come on, man. the wake up america show with my dad today i'd like to share with you three reasons why you should visit dad's online store at apforlibertyshop.com number one you can get exclusive freedom loving merch designed by ap himself or me mom steffi liberty laura has made some designs as well and blimey they are great number two most of these products are so wicked that they aren't even allowed to be advertised on facebook or instagram modern machine guns and a proper keychain plus our grover Cleveland t-shirt is so spicy apparently that leftists on Facebook specifically banned it from appearing on the website. Number three, you're supporting liberty lovers just like you. Spend your money where you earn it and you help me pops build a community that supports what you believe. Bloody hell, this commercial is running too long. Gotta run. Bye now. Don't forget to visit apforlibertyshop.com. That's apforlibertyshop.com. Good morning, rise in freedom. I'm Austin Peterson. You're watching and listening to the Wake Up America Show at wakeupamericashow.com. We're glad and thankful to have you here. 700 people joining us live and the numbers continue to climb. Glad to see everybody. Make sure you click that like button and follow the channel if it's your first time here watching the show. The schedule is Mondays through Fridays from 7 to 9 a.m. Central Time. Hope you guys enjoyed that bonus content. The theme for this week, guns that won. And today's was the Kentucky Rifle, the story of the gun that shaped America's very foundations. Hope you enjoyed that. Can't wait until tomorrow's bonus content. Appreciate everybody for supporting that and unlocking that content today. I know you guys are going to appreciate this week's theme. So make sure you come back and join us each and every day. And of course, thank you to the donors who helped make that bonus content possible. All right. Well, we just had a nice conversation with John Miltimore. He's a weekly regular guest on the program. We always love hearing from him, but then we also like to meet new people. My next guest is endorsed for the U.S. Senate, Senate by none other than Rand Paul. I know you guys are going to be excited to meet Dr. Rick Becker. He's a surgeon, a businessman, and a former America First State legislator. He wants to go to Washington, D.C. to fight with Rand Paul. He's joining us live right now. Dr. Becker, good morning and welcome to the show. Good morning, Austin. Thanks for having me on. Yeah, you've got quite a, a background in fighting for liberty uh, in your career. And uh, uh, in the, um, uh, you were a North Dakota resident where you were also an America First state legislator. Now you're looking to move up to federal office. You started the Bastiat Caucus in North Dakota to teach House and Senate members about free market principles. So we're really excited to talk to you today, Dr. Becker. Um, the first thing that I'd like to, to kind of feel you out on, though, is to talk to you about a little bit of, of the, um, rather than the hardcore policy issues we're going to get to in a moment, it, America is sort of paralyzed with culture wars at this point. It's difficult for us to have anything move forward, to have any real progress, not progressivism, but actual progress, because anytime a good idea comes out, there's an entrenched establishment and a, a media establishment ready to smear anybody who has a good idea. <laughs> People like yeah. yourself, for, for example. Now, Ronna McDaniel Romney might not be the best example of that. She's more of the milk toast kind of Republican. But if a moderate Republican like Ronna Romney can't even appear on NBC News these days, 
what hope is there for people like us who have actual ideas? <laughs> Yeah, that, that was crazy. The the outcry of the talking heads on NBC uh, that they didn't want her on. She, they, she was the perfect person who so-called represented the right that they could have manipulated, molded however they wanted. But they, they couldn't even tolerate her, which is which is nuts. You know, it's it's interesting, too, because um, she being with the Romney family, you know, I'm a, I'm a Barry Goldwater is one of my political heroes. And this whole divide between people that have true conservative principles, free market principles versus those that are the big government Republicans, I mean, that's been going on since Goldwater and versus Rockefellers. And now you have, uh, you know, the the Romneys, and w which Rana represented that wing. So I'm glad that she's out. Uh, it's a little bit comical that she couldn't make it on NBC because of NBC talking heads. Crazy. There's kind of this, our friend Tom Woods likes to say, an ex, a three by five note card of what is acceptable and allowable opinions, right? And and a, apparently being a Romney is is now associated with being associated with the worst elements of the alt-right. I mean, at, at the end of the day, all they're kind of doing is, is, is increasing the size of the population of people who are on the right. My brother, for example, he was a you know soft liberal, left of center for most of his life. He's voting for Donald Trump this fall because yeah. even though his opinions are the same, the left has moved so far to the left that you can't even have a Romney on your network anymore. I mean, they they really right. are kind of like creating an echo chamber such to the, that that like the intellectual inbreeding on the left it's going to be their downfall, isn't it? Absolutely. They the the left has such a herd mentality and, and such a enforcement of uh, aligning with everything that they say. If you step out at all, boom, you're out. You're on the outside. And so they're, they're, that circle of theirs, that herd of theirs is becoming ever smaller, ever more tight and ever screechingly louder for these crazy ideas that they have for America. Dr. Becker, I want America to be the land of the free. And I think, you know, the the problem with both political parties is to some extent they kind of want to kill the goose that lays the golden eggs. The reason why the illegal immigration problem in the United States is so strong is not just because the security on the southern border is so lax. That's, of course, part of it. But it's because the incentive to come to the United States is incredible, like a land of milk and honey overflowing with prosperity. I mean, we've got our problems, sure, but... We don't want to make policies that attack what makes America great, but we also want to have a secure southern border, but we also don't want to have a police state. I mean, how do you sort of like thread the needle when it comes to the immigration question, Dr. Becker? I'd be curious to get your take. Well, yeah, so it's it's very interesting, right? Especially when we talk about it from a libertarian perspective, but I, I take the approach that a, a when we talk about free market, the market was is within a certain geopolitical uh, confine, right? You have to have a country before that country can have some form of government, some form of economy. And a country without a border is not a country. So the idea is, yes, we are the, the land of milk and honey, the land of opportunity. But if, it, if we have a redistributive welfare state, then that takes away that that uh, the the benefit of having immigrants come in legally and mass because now that's a burden instead of a benefit to our society and increasing production and so forth it's now it's now an anchor it's a drag so the way I look at it is if we can step back some of that that welfare aspect of our society that will help but we do need to get a secure border stop the drug trafficking the human trafficking you know i know folks i i, I truly know i'm friends with people uh, in central america and they are hard working people they would be great to come here and they're trying to figure out how they can come to america they want to do it legally and it's nuts to me that they know if they try and do it legally it's going to take them years and they'll probably never get here but if they do it illegally like people they know they're not only going to be welcomed with open arm, but they're going to be given an apartment. They're going to be given a stipend. I mean, this is so completely turned on its head. And I don't know. I mean, it, it, it's truly an invasion. I don't know if it's intentional. I don't I don't know if it's a Cloward Piven kind of thing. It makes no sense to me. Uh, I don't know what your thoughts are. 
Yeah, no, I, I I agree with you largely. I mean, I'm I'm not um, I'm an ideologue, but uh, I'm also flexible, and I understand that in order for us to have a common market, as we've discussed here, as you brought up uh, in the United States, we do have to have a geographical area that we define, or we're going to enforce a, a certain rule set here, and we're going to have free markets within this area, and we we can't control or police Mexico. We shouldn't be the policemen of the world overseas either. But at the end of the day, there are people who are coming across our southern border who wish to do us harm. And there yes. needs to be there needs to be a filtering process to ensure that people who are bring, being brought here are, are not being brought here and being trafficked. But on that topic, I find myself in a, in a bit of a pickle, Dr. Becker, and I, I would be curious to hear your thinking about this on the question that was decided recently in a court case. Uh, and it's been very controversial amongst Republicans. And that was the question of an illegal migrant who was detained at a protest and was found to be in possession of a firearm. Now, the judge, who is a leftist activist judge, typical Soros, you know, uh, funded uh, district attorney type, you know, then becomes the judge. Um, this person, this judge threw out the gun charge that was laid against them, right? An illegal in possession of a firearm. And Republicans are sort of trashing, you know, the liberty wing of the party saying this is what happens with libertarians because they defend the inalienable rights of anyone who is within the United States to own a firearm. So it's already illegal for the person to buy a gun here in the United States. But the mere act of possession in and of itself, I don't want to create a new crime that's a gun crime where no crime existed before. But then our critics will say, on the other hand, well, you're, we have this invasion and you're just going to let them, you're going to allow the illegals to have guns. But my thinking is, Dr. Becker, and then I'll let you unravel this in your own way. My thinking on this is, what if it's a woman who's being trafficked and she comes into possession of a firearm to use against her trafficker? She has the same right of self-defense as, as any of us in that situation. We sh she shouldn't be arrested for the gun crime, but I mean, she's here illegally. She didn't come of her, her own free will, but she happened to be in possession of a firearm. I mean, this is kind of a hypothetical and a theoretical, but how would you unravel this this sweater if you were going to pull this thread? How do you feel well, about the, that that question specifically? Yeah, I think maybe some threads on sweaters should just be ignored and kind of uh, brushed down because I don't, <laughs> I don't I don't think that we necessarily need to get into those. I think you 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 started to get where I'm going, and that is they're already here illegally. They've already committed an act, which then re should require us to send them back, to deport them back to the country from which they came. Um, if they have, in addition, other charges that are that are not victimless charges, it doesn't matter. They already, we should already de be deporting them because what's the alternative? Are we going to incarcerate them at cost to taxpayers in the United States? You know, that's ridiculous too. So unless they've done something in which there was a true victim, uh, all these added charges of these things that they may or may not uh, have that where we can discuss, okay, what's the libertarian component or not? Dude, all I know is they're here illegally. They need to go back. Dr. Becker, how do you feel about the left's lawfare against Donald Trump and their attempts to impoverish him through our criminal justice system? Right. I think this is actually a really, really bi big deal. Uh, this is the kind, you know, we... we Banana Republic is a term that's thrown about a lot, but when you effectively, it, it this lawfare is so significant, it's almost like a, a physical form of, of confrontation in which you're not allowing someone to become a candidate. You're preventing them. And, and I, I think this really crosses that, that line of what we can permit is acceptable. Of course, there should be the capability of filing a lawsuit, uh, whether the person is a, a, a president, an ex-president, doesn't matter. The Everyone should be uh, um, before equal before the law. There should be one tier of justice, right? But when it's obvious that it's lawfare, as you said, all these multiple lawsuits with the sole aim of preventing someone from attaining an elected position, I'm I'm not sure what the answer is. I mean, the the simple answer is clear. We must stop. We must not allow this to happen. But how do we go in and change the workings? What's happening to Trump is is an ab abomination, frankly. I, if it can happen to him, it can happen to anybody, and that should scare people. 
Dr. Becker, you probably don't know much about my background. In 2016, I was a uh, presidential candidate for the Libertarian Party. Um, in 2017, I joined the Republican Party uh, and voted for Donald Trump in 2020. Now I'm uh, a, a delegate for Donald Trump here in the state of Missouri. So I've undergone kind of a sea change in my thinking about Donald Trump. One, starting with trepidation before he was elected because some of his concerns concerning comments about economics that I, I disagreed with. But when I saw him in the office and the way that he handled the presidency, I actually thought that he did a pretty darn good job. I was actually convinced by much of what Donald Trump did to advance liberty here in the United States. Not perfectly, but, you know, you don't even get to pick, you know, a perfect wife or husband, right? You, you got to <laughs> compromise at the end of the day. Um, what's been your thinking of Donald Trump and how he how he governed while he was president and his in his campaign? Were you kind of like me in that sense that you were uh, skeptical at first? Has he has he brought you around? I mean, how do you feel about President right. Donald Trump and his reelection chances this fall? So I was I was very concerned, honestly, when when we had I think it was 17 people <laughs> to choose from in the primary in 2016. Uh, he was definitely not top on the list for me. Uh, I I always liked him, uh, read his book and 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 admired what he accomplished. But I was concerned for certain basic economic uh, principles that he wasn't going to be the right choice. But he did impress me when he was in office. Now, I, again, I didn't agree with everything. Trade policy is a really easy one I can throw out. Didn't agree with it. But as you said, you're not going to get anyone un unless it's you yourself uh, that you'll agree with 100% of the time. What he did with decreasing regulation, decreasing taxes, getting conservative judges, uh, uh, standing up for America. This, America first isn't just a, a tagline that you throw out. It's important. We have we need our, the sovereignty of our country. We need to stop kowtowing to these international organizations, you know, IMF and WTO and WHO and the United Nations. Him standing up for us and standing up in this in this war of progressivism, in which effectively I would say the progressives elected Donald Trump. They made it so conservatives were so sick of being silenced, so sick of being harassed for expressing a, an opinion different from what the narrative was supposed to be, that here came this character that represented someone who's going to fight back. And so when you think about that, that, I mean, so I, I really admired what he did as president. I think he's going to be reelected. And uh, here's the thing, I'm, <laughs> I've thought, the way I think about Donald Trump is this, it, I recently watched Game of Thrones, so I was a latecomer, right? I don't know. Did you watch that, Austin? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay, so so you have right, you have different fronts. You've got the the uh, the that Western world, or whatever, with all the different kingdoms, right? And the different kings are fighting, and that's where their attention is, and and they're fighting, blah blah blah. But what there, there's this other thing going on, which you have across the wall with all those evil, you know, scary zombie people, and. Donald Trump represents someone who's going to fight all the scary zombie people, the progressives, the international, the globalists, the, you know, all of those folks. And we, you and I tend to worry about policy, which I would say is the little kingdoms locally. And so, yes, we may not agree. I don't agree with trade policy, but what's more important is this America first and what he represents in that aspect. Yeah, I agree with you, Dr. Becker. Um, uh, kind of a bit on the big picture question here, you know, in the 1970s, Richard Nixon went to China. And in the 1990s, Bill Clinton brought China into the World Trade Organization. And the belief was at that time, people like ourselves who are proponents of free trade, that the liberalization of the Chinese economy would have uh, a, a positive effect on their government and it would be more friendly to the American government and that, you know, we might be able to help plant seeds of freedom in China using the the power of the American economy. But it seems as if the, the reality has been that the opposite has occurred, that the normalization of trade relations with China has actually made it such that the Chinese are planting seeds of authoritarianism here within the United States. It, when we saw what happened with the COVID-19 pandemic and how careless the Chinese were with the loss of life or how they treated us, during the pandemic and the lies about how that pandemic was spread here in the United States and with the associated trillions of dollars of loss and millions of lives that were lost uh, to this pandemic. Do you think that it was a mistake for us to sort of create these sort of normalization of 
of relations of trade with China? Should we have prop, you know, not brought them into the WTO? Would we have been better off if we had let them languish as a backwater and perhaps built up, you know, trade relations with India or with friendlier nations? Well, I, I like the idea of continuing to build up with India, but no, I don't. I don't think I would go there. The the problems I have with COVID nineteen all point back to our own federal government. Uh, yes, I understand China was a player in in this in this whole situation uh, and a big player. But if we think about what we could have done uh, in our own in the confines of our own country, uh, instead of listening to World Health Organization, instead of the CDC running rampant as a leftist organization with a with an authoritarian fascist sort of narrative, working hand in glove with uh, all of these businesses where we all. It, all with one voice, you know, um, six foot distance, all of the, all of what we experienced, which was so detrimental, came from our own government, from our federal government, from our state governments, from various public health sources. What the Chinese did, yes, played a role. But if we had handled things properly here, we would have been so much better off. So I think until we can get our own house in order, I'm not too worried about the Chinese. Becker, um, you are a surgeon, so you uh, have a bit of in, more insight into the medical questions related to how COVID-19 was handled here in the United States. So many people have lost faith in your profession because of what occurred, the scientific and medical malfeasance during the COVID-19 pandemic. Is there any way to bring it back? I mean, or should we bring it back? Do you think it's a good thing now that people are looking at, well, no offense, people like yourself with perhaps a more jaundiced eye, doctor. <laughs> no, I'm I'm looking at the medical industry, medical profession with a jaundiced eye, if you will. Uh, I was so incredibly disappointed with how my colleagues fell in line and, and goose-stepped their way right along with the CDC. Very, very disappointed. I had uh, threats or complaints uh, to try and take my license away because I was not going along because I was using uh, my, my, you know, using my own brains to make decisions. This idea that we must follow the science and people in the health field should understand what science is, which is always questioning, which is testing, which is coming up with with uh, uh, new ideas or confirming previous ideas, but always testing and asking questions. This new trust the science is actually scientism, which was which is nothing to do with science, nothing to do with health. It's all about falling in line with a government mandate, a government narrative. And and it shocked me. Because I think we have had over the past few decades a huge transition of healthcare, the healthcare field being people who were people of science, uh, people of 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 uh, uh, ingenuity, now becoming public health officials, uh, and it's shocking. And and it, you know the most egregious of all of them is the American Academy of Pediatricians. Wow, these guys are crazy leftist communists. They're the people that are in in favor of. Uh, uh, abortions without informing parents uh, of mutilating children with the, the transitioning surgery and putting them on uh, puberty blockers. One thing after another, they are so far left and they, they were at the forefront. The pediatricians were at the forefront of all of these crazy governmental demands uh, that the CDC put forth. And um, so, yes, I agree with you, Austin, very disappointed. Can we get our trust back in, in our healthcare uh, professionals, you know, I, I think that'll be on a, on a, it's gotta be on a one-on-one -on -one basis. You know, you go to your doctor, you get a sense, do you trust them? Where are they at on things? And because there are a lot of good folks uh, like myself that stood up against the narrative, it's a matter of finding us. We're speaking to Dr. Rick Becker. He's a husband, a father, a surgeon, a businessman, and a former state legislator. He's now running for Congress in North Dakota. And congratulations on the announcement of your campaign. You've got the Rand Paul endorsement, Dr. Becker. What are you hoping to accomplish in your campaign other than just winning? Uh, well, yeah, I, what I've been all about for the, as a state legislator as well is spreading the message of freedom, getting people involved, getting people to understand where our country's going and where it could head if we all got involved and took a role instead of uh, being apathetic. 
What I'd like to do is get to Congress and uh, probably three things. One is uh, continue spreading that message to the United States, people of the United States, to help build a bench in North Dakota of true conservatives that will continue to lead. Uh, and then, of course, just to be a darn good congressman that's going to stick to principle and always vote according to principle and never, ever, ever back down. There's something in uh, the curly hair, I guess, that makes legislators more libertarian. <laughs> Dr. Rick Becker, hey, congratulations on your announcement and that very impressive uh, endorsement from Dr. Rand Paul. Is there anything else that you'd like to share with our listeners or plug before we let you go today? Well, yeah, I'll say we have very few people. Uh, Dr. Rand Paul is one of them, and so is Thomas Massey with the curly hair. I don't know what it is either, <laughs> but but I want to join the, the the ranks of people like that so that we form a critical mass and we actually can make a difference. And if there's any hope in turning this ship around that we call America, this is the last hope. We have to get people of principle, consistent principle, to D.C. I'd like people to go to rickbecker2024.com, rickbecker2024.com. There you go. Rick Becker, 2024.com. Visit it right now. Find out what he's all about. We've got a new war warrior in the fight for liberty, and we're very glad to meet him this morning. Dr. Becker, thanks so much for getting up early and joining us here. We hope you'll come back. Thanks for being generous with your time, and good luck in your campaign. We wish you the best. Thanks a lot, Austin. Thank you very much. That's Dr. Rick Becker. What did you guys think? Pretty good, huh? Send us a text. Let us know what you think at 573-319-1586. Again, the text line's open, and you can send us your thoughts at 573-319-1586. We love seeing 256 people joining us over at Rumble. And how many over on X.com? 639 people joining us live on X.com. That's very impressive. Thank you, Elon. By the way, if you're one of the 640 or so people who are joining us live at x.com, there is a live chat that you can participate in, and we'd love to have you come over and join us in the live chat on x.com. If it's a bridge too far for you to join us at rumble.com slash AP for Liberty, then just an FYI, there is a live chat over there. I can I know that sometimes getting people to transfer between platforms is tedious for whatever reason. Some people like some platforms and they don't like another. But if you are over at x.com and you'd like to participate, there is a chat. You just have to click on the video that you're watching right now to bring up the chat screen that will appear on the right-hand side of the screen. So I know that it's kind of new for people to see streaming on X, so the community hasn't developed much in the chat feed, but we'd love it if you'd go over there, introduce yourself, and um, I do follow and monitor the chats during the live stream. So head over there and introduce yourself and say uh, how you found the Wake Up America show, because I imagine that for many of you, 640 or so, you might not be following me, AP for Liberty there, um, but if you are, then say hello. We'd love to hear from you. And of course, it's nice to see all of our regular friends and fans over at rumble.com, like Quest Fanning, Luke Sacker, D. Nathan, um, Sign of Jonah, Joni Rankin, what's up, hottie? And uh, we've got Mighty Megatron as well as many of our other regular friends joining us live at Rumble.com. What's up, people? Hey, of the 261 people who are watching us at Rumble.com, how many of you have clicked the like button? Come on. Let's get some more likes over there on that Rumble feed this morning. Uh, less than 10 minutes away, we're going to hear from Aaron Sepulveda about Javier Malay of Argentina pushing now to fire 70,000 government employers. Oh, my God. Oh, my God. 70,000 government employees. Oh, yeah? Well, our, transport our transportation secretary is gay. So take that. Why? Why? Why does Argentina get to have Javier Malay? We get nothing. We get nothing, Lebowski. How dare you? I just can you imagine what the leftists must be feeling like right now, working at the in the government of Argentina, and he's like, "I'm firing seventy thousand afuera." They're screaming. They're running around. They're they're stealing everything that isn't pinned down. At whatever government agency that they're working for. I can't wait to hear from Aaron Sepulveda about that. We're going to hear from him in about five minutes. Just wanted to give you all a brief reminder uh, that today is the launch of a brand new show as part of the Wake Up America network. The Wake Up America show is streaming live now, but after the show is over, the launch of a new show, not live, launches today. It's Stephanie's hustling and homemaking talk show. You don't want to miss it. 
Yo voy a votar por Steffi P. Uh, Steffi for Liberty is launching her new show, brand new show today, and the video debuts at 9.05 a.m. So today's Wake Up America shows it ends at 9 o'clock, and then at 9.05, the video goes live. So if you'd like to watch Stephanie's new video, Hustling and Homemaking, you're going to want to check that out. You can find the video at ap4libertyshop.com. That's AP, the number four, ap4libertyshop.com. You'll be able to click on the link and watch the video. Stephanie's beautiful little videos about, um, you know, being a full-time mom and, you know, working a career on the side. It's a new show featuring her stories, balancing pregnancy, motherhood, homemaking, and keeping a career on the side. So you can follow along with Steffi's adventures in hustling and homemaking. So make sure that you, uh, right after the show is over today, go to ap4libertyshop.com. At 9.05, the video will premiere. You'll be able to click this little uh, button right there to watch. Premiering 37 minutes from now. Thank you, Steffi. La buena vida. Solo, hola, solo popa mía. I got that, that Latinos for Trump uh, song stuck in my head. It's so catchy. It's a bop. So again, don't forget the launch of the Wake Up uh, Network's um, new show, Hustling and Homemaking, available today. All right, Javier Malay, afuera. 70,000 government employees to be fired. <laughs> and that hit piece on Javier Malay. Was there any merit to it? We're going to talk about that when we get back. Don't go away. It's the Wake Up America show at wakeupamericashow.com. Bonus content for the Wake Up America show is The Guns That Won, featuring the five greatest weapons that helped to build the American Republic. Part one, the Kentucky Rifle. Today we examine the little known history of the Kentucky Rifle, a pivotal yet almost forgotten implement that played a significant role in the early days of the United States. The Kentucky Rifle, a crucial tool in winning the North American continent, was indispensable during the migration westward. This mass movement, driven by various factors including the search for new land, shaped the early American frontier. Calling it a rifle, however, may be a misnomer since the initial version was smoothbore and not rifled. The westward migration followed well-defined routes, with one passing through Lancaster, Pennsylvania. Here, the stage was set for the birth of a unique firearm, influenced by German and Swiss settlers. Rifling technology, believed to have originated in Central Europe, was refined by these settlers to meet the harsh requirements of the American frontier. The early European rifles were unsuitable for frontier life, prompting local gunsmiths to innovate. They created a lighter, more reliable and accurate rifle, which became indispensable for survival in the wilderness. By 1721, an unnamed gunsmith crafted a new flintlock rifle, marking a significant advancement in firearms technology. This rifle was designed with an emphasis on accuracy, ease of loading, and durability. The Lancaster rifle, developed around 1739, evolved into what is known today as the Kentucky rifle. This firearm was distinguished by its craftsmanship, accuracy, and unique design features. The Kentucky rifle's effectiveness was greatly enhanced by the invention of the patch, which increased accuracy and made loading easier. This innovation was a key factor in the rifle's superiority. Loading the Kentucky rifle was a meticulous process that involved several steps, ensuring the weapon's reliability and performance. Over time, the rifle underwent modifications to maintain accuracy, including re-rifling and adjustments to bullet molds. The Kentucky rifle reached its peak development by 1760 with the introduction of the set or hair trigger, further improving its accuracy. During its heyday, the Kentucky rifle was not only a practical tool, but also a work of art, adorned with intricate decorations and inlays. The Kentucky rifle's legacy is a testament to the ingenuity and resourcefulness of early American settlers. It was not just a weapon, but a symbol of survival and determination. Today, the Kentucky rifle stands as a historical artifact, representing a pivotal era in American history and the challenges faced by those who dared to venture into the unknown. In closing, the story of the Kentucky Rifle is a fascinating chapter in American history, reflecting the spirit of innovation and the relentless pursuit of progress that defined the early years of the United States.
Good morning. Rise in freedom. I'm Austin Peterson. You're watching and listening to the Wake Up America show at wakeupamericashow.com. We're glad and grateful to have you here. Make sure you click that like button and subscribe to the channel. If it's your very first time watching the program today, we want to make sure you come back and join us on the regs. Every Monday through Friday from 7 to 9 a.m. Central Time, the Wake Up America show streams live. The video that you just watched is part of our daily bonus content program. This week's theme for our bonus content, which our listeners are unlocking, is Guns That Won. And today's featured the Kentucky Rifle, which, of course, wasn't really a rifle at all. It was a smooth bore, but it might be a misnomer, but it's still one of the guns that won the American Republic. Each day this week, we're going to feature a new firearm that helped build the American Republic. So make sure you come back each day and help us to unlock that bonus content by getting in your Rumble Rants or making a qualifying purchase at ap4libertyshop.com. And of course, right after the show today, the launch of our brand new show as part of the Wake Up America Network. And that is Hustling and Homemaking, starring Stephanie for Liberty, giving a little bit of unsolicited advice from the unsolicited advice that she got for her first time pregnancy. Make sure you check that out right after the show. But we've still got lots more great content to go while we're live. Javier Malay of Argentina, God bless this man, announces a new government plan to fire 70,000 government workers. And yet some people still aren't happy. They're writing hit pieces on him in Reason Magazine, which I think are quite unreasonable. Joining us now to discuss is economist and friend of the show, Aaron Sepulveda, joining us live now. Good morning, Aaron. Welcome to the show. Good morning. Thank you for inviting me. Happy to be here again. Glad to have you. Afuera, 70,000 government employees, Aaron. I see you smiling, your black heart. What's going to happen to the children? <laughs> they're they're going to produce more goods and services in the private sector, and that's going to bring down inflation. Okay, so then give us, so you've, you've summed it up, interview over, done. <laughs> <laughs> it is, Aaron, that, that, you see, that is what they don't want to understand. Like a lot of people that are saying, like, well, what about these people? They're going to find another job, like everyone does. And it happens to be a job that is on demand because the things that are being produced in that job are on demand and they are on demand. And those are the ones that are being pushed up in prices because that's what people are buying. Therefore, we need to focus on those goods, not on whatever bureaucratic uh, plans, uh, idealistic, whatever, whatever, because their priorities, you know, the priority is bring down the cost of living of Argentines. And that's exactly what happens. It's just that it's done in an indirect way. And that's why a lot of people have a hard time. Just to think about, oh, yeah, uh, uh, a broker is going to move to the private sector and produce goods and services that people actually want. It's something for people that never uh, occur. Uh, think about the um, economics in one lesson. I'm pretty sure most of your listeners have, uh, uh, have read or they should read. And it's precisely to say, okay, it's not just the one step action or policy but it's all of the further actions that happen because you have to see just how the whole system, that's why we call it macroeconomics and microeconomics. What, what the administration, the new administration is dealing with is to have to fix the macroeconomy, the, the framework in which humans are going to interact. And what a lot of people in Argentina and Southern United States too are used to it is that the government is not just supposed to set up the framework, but the specifics. And, uh, and now following uh, Edmund Burke, the government is to create, it's there to create a space, not to determine uh, what to do in that space. That's a private, that's a private issue. And mm -hmm. a lot of people have a hard time with it. Now on the news uh, front here, Javier Malay, he announces his plans to slash 70,000 government jobs. Sounds like a lot. He's already fired 50,000, right? They've already been dismissed. While that does sound like a lot, over 100,000 employees, apparently Argentina has 3.5 million public sector employees. So it's not really that much overall, is it? Not at all. And that, that's why the numbers are staggering because we're like, well, that's a lot of jobs. And so, well, yeah, sure. But that's very little compared to the rest because you have to include not just the federal bureaucrats, but the bureaucrats of the province level uh, at the level of the provinces and in those ones there's a lot of programs that have to be caught because nobody knows where the money goes there's a bunch of money that has to be uh, uh, that has to be sent to the to the local areas mostly state types I guess provinces but it's no way to know whether it's being used properly or not so those things also have to uh, have to stop and the way you know something is odd 
is the size of the bureaucracy. That's usually the way you see it. If it's a large bureaucracy, you know that there's a bunch of favors being paid off. If the bureaucracy is small and and uh, and certain money is being spent, we're saying, okay, sure, for sure, more than likely we can use other theory to understand what's going on. But the fact that you have a bloated bureaucracy immediately tells you that something's off. Now, in this piece that I'm citing here from Reason, he says it says beyond cutting jobs, Malay announced plans to halt public works. He says it's something of which he is deeply proud because public works are a great source of corruption, of theft, which I imagine all good people should oppose. But here in the United States, Aaron, Republicans and Democrats have all agreed that what the, um, the American people really need is to invest in infrastructure. Isn't infrastructure a good thing? Why does Javier Malay not want to invest in infrastructure? That, 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 that's a big issue. We're saying, okay, let's, let's set up a, um, a space. Yeah, but the problem is that as of now, right now, the setting up of that space in Argentina, it has been terribly corrupt. Like half of the budget goes whatever else that you can imagine. A uh, bunch of overpaying for resources, for uh, for uh, workers get overpaid, the um, suppliers get overpaid. So because of that reality, all of, all of it has to be uh, postponed if not the private sector can uh, try to take care of it. Because at the end of the day, uh, it's not just that the private sector wants to do uh, those types of jobs, it's that they can, in fact, um, sorry about, give me a second. Okay, cool. Thank you is not just that the private sector can do those jobs, is that for right now, the priority of, and this is where I think everyone needs to understand the situation. One of the reasons why the new, uh, the Argentine administration right now cannot cut, cut taxes is because it needs to balance, balance, uh, balance the budget. Sorry, I gotta have my, my image is going crazy, sorry. Okay, that should do, okay. Um, is if they drop taxes, which will be ideal, they will have to drop all the expenditures a lot so we can have a balanced budget and the taxes take money out of circulation, dropping inflation. So the problem is this, we, they could only lower taxes if it was possible to lower spending a lot, but how are we gonna lower spending very quickly as it will be ideal if we have a bloated bureaucracy of 3.5 uh, million and a lot of the bureaucracy does not even depend directly upon the federal administration, but it depends upon the provinces. So they're trying as much as possible to say, we're going to have to spend less. If that implies not spending in public works for, let's say, one or two years, well, then that's going to have to be done. Because in any way, since a lot of those resources are being wasted, they tend to be malinvestments. Yeah, there's a lot of money spent on, let's say, one road, but the road only serves like, you know, half or one tenth of the people that are being. And, and many people in the United States should be familiar. It's just in Argentina, it happened to the end, to the end degree. Uh, if you guys remember that sometimes in uh, the middle of Alaska, there was a federal, I remember the one was really well, it was like a million dollar worth bus stop in uh, in, in Alaska or a, a $2 million bridge to nowhere. Like those are the type of projects that happen in Argentina all the time. Things that nobody uses, things are complete. Uh, they're literally done just like a job program for people that help you during the elections. That's it. That, that's what they are. So whatever you think about the government should or should not do public works, Right now, they have to be halted, even if nobody wants to do them. Now, that's the issue that we do think that there's people that want to do it. They just have to be paid privately and, 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 and enforced privately. But the point is, right now, it is the, bal the budget has to be balanced, independent even of taxes. This is not even an ideological issue. To get money out of circulation and not put it back on, because that will be the problem with lowering taxes, that you couldn't get as many money out of circulation. And that tells you the difficulties compared to the United States. When Trump came, came along, in merely dropped taxes and prices didn't fly like crazy. It was very expansionary and it was noticeable. Okay, why? That can be done even without dropping uh, expenditures. Well, one of the critiques we had uh, uh, to, uh, to Trump was that sure, taxes went down, which was great, but expenditures didn't. Well, in the US it's not such a rush because the currency, because literally the government is not trying to get dollars out of circulation, quite the opposite, trying to get, get more dollars out of, uh, into circulation. And they can give themselves in the United States. We actually, because we're dollar users and earners, we can give that uh, ourselves that kind of luxury because the demand for dollars, the amount of use of dollars is so high that people do tend to hold dollars and sell the stuff for them. For the year in time peso, it doesn't work that way. You literally have to get rid of it. And it was noticeable. When did inflation started to come down after December? As soon as the 
amount um the amount of money in circulation finally finally stopped compared to like uh to uh two two years before. So the point is right now the difficulty that everyone is gonna have to face is the government has to shrink and it cannot and it cannot be through lower taxes, it has to be through lower expenditures because that's the only way to keep money out of circulation and uh to try to control inflation before uh before dollarization so that dollarization is not such a big shock that's pretty much why they're uh trying to postpone it right. so well, i he's hope got it a makes lot of, sense well, yeah it does then he's getting a lot of criticism uh uh for that for putting off those dollarization plans we'll, we'll get to that in just a moment but very briefly i want to reset for those who might just be tuning into the to the show live if so, then uh, welcome to the Wake Up America show. I'm Austin Peterson. I'm speaking to Aaron Sepulveda. He's an economist and an expert on South American affairs. We're talking about Javier Malay of Argentina and his plan to fire an additional 70,000 government employees in addition to the 50,000 that he had initially called for. Um, but of course, that is a drop in the bucket of the 3.5 million government employees that exist and work in Argentina. Um, uh, Aaron, I'd like to ask you uh, one question related to that before we move on to this hit piece that somebody wrote, um, that we know, uh, wrote about Javier Malay and have you respond to some of the criticisms. But is there, uh, he's only been the president of Argentina since December, and he's made some big changes. Some of his push for reforms have had a lot of pushback, and he hasn't been able to get across the finish line. But are there any signs that what he has done so far is working? Have there been any signs that have shown that what Javier Malay has done has actually had a positive impact on his country? The, the most important one is the exchange rate. The exchange rate has been stable, which is unbelievable. We thought it was going to be already, let's say, uh, $1 to like 1600 or so by now. And it has been stable around 1000 which is pretty much unbelievable, which makes dollarization easier. So it's kind of like a step-by-step. -step. You first have to stabilize the exchange rate. Because remember, some of you guys already knew this big issue was uh, there was a lot of problems with the exchange rate because they used to use the exchange rate as a way to... I mean, there's 5 million subsidies in, in Argentina. Uh, the exchange rate policy was, they used use it for another subsidy. And that was creating a huge amount of debts uh, to the former government that the current government had to, had to take care of it. So it was literally the first thing they have to do is try to reduce the money supply and stabilize the exchange rate looking forward to the um, to the dollarization. Because if it's too stable, unstable, dollarization becomes a little more, uh, a, li a little more difficult and cumbersome and, and so on and so forth. So that, the, the fact that the exchange rate is stable seems that it increased. This is what happened. The policies of Millet increased the demand for pesos. Pe people are willing to hold on to them because they know that any moment they can go and switch it for dollars. And you can pretty much guess what's going to be the pro uh, uh, the proper uh, the exchange rate. You don't know. Like before, you didn't know if it was going to be 1,000 or 1,600 at any moment. Today, you know it's going to be somewhere around 1,000. So that people can hold on to dollar to uh to pesos just for a little while, and that in itself prevents hyperinflation because the the that concern first concern was as soon as they start getting rid of uh I hope this makes sense to your listeners and sorry for taking this long. There was a lot of price controls in Argentina. Many companies could not raise prices depending upon uh, upon the demand of goods and services. They will have to keep certain fixed price. Well, what's the problem with that one is that by not letting prices go up, the quantity supply does not increase. So production doesn't increase. And so when people ask, hey, how come the economy of Argentina has been in trouble since 2011? So, well, because with price controls, yeah, sure. When you look at the measurements of prices, it looks like, oh, look, they're not rising prices as fast. Well, they're not rising prices as fast because they're not allowed to produce more. So it's one, it's one or the other. Yeah, sure. You have prices don't go as fast as otherwise. But they're being uh, artificially stopped. This happened in the in World War II, where inflation looked like it was it was it was small. But then it was saying, look at that, they're controlling prices and just private product private consumption uh, collapsed. Now he had to lift all of the price controls because you lift the price controls, prices were going to rise. We knew that already. The first goal was just make sure that when we lift up the price controls, uh prices don't rise up 50% a month, which will be hyperinflation. That that was the first commitment that he had. And the first month, he got really high. It was like 25% or so. But now every single month, inflation, the, the pace at which prices are rising, 
has been actually little by little falling and falling and falling and falling consistently, which means it has worked. So we have the two things, inflation, the not rich hyperinflation, which is what everybody thought it was going to happen. And the exchange rate has been stable, which means there's trustworthiness. Also, uh, Argentine companies the, uh, in the stock market have risen in, their, in prices and that debt of the federal government of Argentina has risen in price. There is trustworthiness. The problem, obviously, why there's going to be some complaints, and you know there should be, so we, sh we should know, is that it takes time. We have to go first. Okay, first exchange rate, then uh, stabilize. Uh, then the next one is, okay, we continue. The next one is the bureaucracy. But you can make all the changes in the world, but if you have a gigantic bureaucracy, they're going to continue to consume uh, resources, 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 resources. It makes no difference whatever else. Uh, that you do. So yes, the specific that you can see, it's macroeconomics. This is what I want a lot of people need to understand. The government of Millet is not going to get involved in your microeconomic reality. That's you, that's your family. The only thing they're going to say do is set up a framework in which Argentines can develop uh, their businesses, their families, their goals, uh, and uh, and their future-oriented uh, future uh, projects. It's not going to solve anyone's problems. It's just going to set, uh, set up a space. It is noticeable the problem is that it's painful. That's the uh, way. It, and it, and it by is. the way, and he knew. nobody wants the pain. Nobody wants to deal with the pain and the suffering. And certainly everybody would love to have some panacea where we could just overnight turn something into a capitalist utopia. But that's just simply not how markets work. Um, I'd like to ask you to respond to this article, which everybody was talking about last week from Reason Magazine again. The article's title is, Is Javier Malay Making Argentina Great Again? The subheading is that the new Argentine president is popular with American libertarians, people like us, but his record at home looks increasingly populist and authoritarian. This was written by Antonella Marty, uh, who I used to work with uh, uh, in Washington, D.C. We weren't necessarily like close friends or acquaintances, but I knew who she was, and we worked in the same office. Um, I was kind of shocked to read an article like this from her, but... You know, I'm open to let you know anybody should be open to criticism, including a politician, for example. But Our I did, favorite ones even more so. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And I, but I didn't feel like she really hit the mark in calling him an authoritarian or a populist, in as if that were a pejorative. I mean, I understand that the definitions of those between Argentina and the United States is very different. However, yeah, it it felt a little bit of what they call, and I'm learning now in Argentina, they call them cafe liberals. Right, they sit in coffee shops, drinking, uh, drinking yerba mate and coffee, and uh, you know, criticizing some who do while they sit around and talk. What was your re reaction to this article, Aaron? Uh, my reaction it was that was that it was unfair. Uh, then again, we discussed this before. People are discussing this as if there were no such a thing as trade-offs. So you're gonna have to get to do it, and, and even more so in Ar like, come on, guys, in Argentina, of all places, is the one that is gonna have trade-offs, like. The, the one that I'm telling you right now, we don't dollarize first and say, well, what if our trade-off is we have to first stabilize the exchange rate and everything else has to wait. And, you know, and, and this also has to do with, you know, the social media and you have experienced it. Uh, we want everything quick. We want everything fast. Uh, it's not whether it's right or wrong, it's what's first. And so everybody wants solutions right away. And it's just not possible when they say authoritarian. I, the only thing, the closest that I have ever heard of authoritarianism, it will be the fact that they were trying to tell people to not close the streets. And, and, that, and that's about it. Now, the only criticism that I would accept, and I made it myself beforehand, it was that sometimes whenever some libertarians, uh, usually, uh, let's say, all academics would disagree with Millet, Many times he would respond very, uh, how to say, uh, very strongly against them in a totally inappropriate way. And there's a big debate. So, yeah, well, that's his personality. You need to understand if he didn't have the personality, he wouldn't even get elected to begin with. And those kinds of things we did discuss this once in a lot, a lot of Argentine uh, academics and, and intellectuals have told him, have addressed it. Mm, a lot of them that got in, uh, got in, um, had a deep d disagreements with, with Millet have already made peace with him and they actually have uh, moved forward or the other ones haven't. That is something that I think is very criticizable of, of Millet is that many times he didn't know how to respond properly. Now, he has improved a lot, by the way, just so you guys know. I mean, you guys are not used to it, but I, I'm used to watching him just go wild at, at, at absolutely everything. Um, and he has improved a lot. That criticism, the one that then when the way he treated some 
uh, some criticisms from from academic libertarians, I do think that he responded uh, inappropriately. But that's very different than policy. You see what I'm saying? Uh, those sure. are uh, proper Well, here's modes, what she proper... says. This is what how mm -hmm. Antonella described him. She says that Javier Malay poses a threat both to Argentina and to the global liberty movement. She sees him as a self-obsessed populist with a savior complex. His actions contradict his words. He raises taxes, escalates the drug war, restricts social freedoms, threatens his uh, political opponents, and appoints political hacks from previous corrupt administrations to positions of power. He sounds like, the way Antonella's describing him, like he's a really bad guy. He's <laughs> not. Okay, this is the problem. Is this, again, waiting I mean, Antonella for, uh, is from Argentina, so you would think that she knows a thing or two about what's happening in, in her country. Oh, she knows. It's just that she's been incredibly like then the same thing you can be there looking at the reality and interpreting it as like well it's not as perfect as i wish well yeah sure i can tell i could tell you that you didn't have to tell you know you didn't have to tell me she that says he's a threat she says that he is a threat not only to argentina but to us here in the united states i think this is the issue but and i, I will say i was able to respond to uh that passage that you discussed for example when it took, what is the threat that uh libertarians are right now in favor of taxation well Sometimes, for example, when he rose taxes, this is how difficult it is when you're actually applying this stuff. For example, there was one time certain taxes have to be raised to compensate for a subsidy that couldn't they couldn't get rid of. See what I'm saying? If you just look, if you just look at it, oh look, he's raising taxes. I say, yeah, yeah, yeah. But it's because it's a subsidy that not is not always easy to get rid of. So a way to try to compensate, you have to raise it. Now, that is a libertarian position, it's just that it's really weird. Why would a libertarian position lead you to raise certain certain adult taxes, by the way? Certain taxes. Oh, because there's a bunch of subsidies. That, that's a reality that we're libertarians. We never think about this. Hey, when you get to power, there's going to be some subsidies that you can't get rid of them. What are you going to do to fix that problem? Oh, I don't know. So, well, raise taxes. Boy, but that's only libertarian. So, no. When we actually apply that reality, it's not only libertarian because it actually balance the budget. So how do you deal with it? You're going to blame him to say, oh, He's just like a typical, let's say, here in the United States, Democrat that just wants to raise taxes on everyone, just to spend more, or whatever. Tell me why were those taxes raised? And that's not discussed. The details are not discussed. These generalities, yeah, well, in general, you can actually make a general case that life is not perfect. But yeah, let's go into the details. What were the trade-offs that led us to this? And the trade-offs mainly in Argentina, and she knows better than this, is that the bureaucracy makes it almost impossible. And is the bureaucrats. It is uh, other politicians that are entrenched. One of the reasons why a lot of uh, policies couldn't pass through set, uh, through the Senate, it's because a lot of the policies that need to be implemented are going to reduce the power and resources of the senators themselves. How are you going to pass something so easily to say, oh, you know what, uh, I'm going to pass this law and everything's going to become libertarian? No, they're not even letting you. You have to find ways around to figure it out. For, for so, so for example, is Raise taxes. Why did uh, some tax, which is really not raising taxes, we're not dropping taxes. We can, They cannot drop taxes as it will be ideal because the budget has to be um, balanced and expenditures, the ideal will be to get rid of all expenditures, literally, and then just drop the budget and you're good to go. But we can't. So what do we do in the meantime? You can't drop taxes. So you lower as much spending as possible month by month and you can't drop taxes because you drop taxes then you're not going to have a balanced budget. That's just reality. That's something that the U.S., we don't have to worry about it too much. We can always, that's why there's always like 30 some trillion dollars of debt because the U.S. debt and U.S. dollar has such a high demand that is not a rush for anybody in the United States. In Argentina, it is a rush to balance the budget. And some of you guys know this one already. Uh, in England, what happened? Conservatives dropped taxes like crazy without dropping spending. Budget shoot up. And immediately interest rate, interest rate went through the roof. The central bank came to try to save the situation and it just devalued the uh, the pound. Okay, think about this. In the US, this doesn't happen. Why? Because they can play around with stuff a little bit and most foreigners and dollar holders can put up with it. But anything outside of the dollar, any little change that you want to make is going to create uh, consequences and responses real quick because the demand for any other currency than the sure. dollar 
we're, we're getting not as stable. We're, we're coming down to the end of uh, uh, of our time here, Aaron. Uh, last question on this before we uh, say goodbye. Um, now I note that Antonella Marta thinks Marty thinks that we should be criticizing politicians like Javier Malay, and I, I agree. Everyone should be open to criticism, especially if you hold elective office. But journalists don't seem to hold that same standard to themselves. I noted that Antonella had blocked me on X.com, despite me not having said a word or hide nor hair of her since all of this ordeal began. Uh, I, I guess that she thinks that journalists themselves should be immune to criticism or a revision of their work. What's her problem? Um, I, I, a lot of, um, uh, there are some libertarians that don't like to deal with, uh, how to say, it? uh, with pushback and now, and don't get me wrong. Usually you get used to it because you get a lot of people, you, you know, how, how to say, it? um, social listen, media is you get yeah listen if, if you're harassing irrelevant. someone it's one thing if you're harassing you see, someone you right and you're going after you them all not. the time or you're doxing them no i was not i had i had not an unkind word to say about her i think i think i shared her article with a gif of a guy who was just said whack like that's whack you know what i mean like this but that's that's, that's it. it i don't think that that's what it was that maybe made her like block me but i mean she she seems like a real paratonta okay so Oh, I am blocked, by the way, just so you know that. Oh, you're blocked, I too. Know I, I just checked right now. Yeah, I just checked right now. <laughs> oh, this, welcome. So, this just, this, welcome to this, the ranks, Aaron. Okay, and, and the, the, this is the reason why I don't want to say something super strong is because it's very it's, it's very her. It's not libertarians in general. It's yeah. just that's the way she is. She doesn't like, she doesn't like to, I, my guess is that she doesn't like to read pushback. And that's very her. That's not, that's not Argentines in general. That's not uh, libertarians. No. with some of her criticisms just to, as, a, as a pushback. Okay, go ahead, but we got we to hurry. Quick. Yeah, okay, so his drug position is a trade-off. Uh, uh, conservatives are with him, and one of the one of the agreements was that drugs were not going to legalize, I'm sorry, decriminalize because, by the way, uh, cannabis is legal for personal use in Argentina, for personal use. So the big complaints that you and I, that anyone can have about drug war do not apply to the things that we are more concerned with. Just regular. What, what is the big issue in the United States? Regular people they're just holding up to a little bit of cannabis and then they go five years to, to jail and destroy their families. That's crazy. That okay. does not happen in Argentina. I just, so I'm just tired of. There. I know, but I'm just tired of like the libertarian criticism. It's like he's firing tens of thousands of government employees. He's shuttering agencies, and they're like, yeah, but he hasn't legalized weed yet. And it's just like, shut the up, like. I believe in legalization, exactly. but for the love of God, we've got bigger They're problems priorities. to face right now. Yes, it's trade-offs. Right. All right, and don't be so don't be so soft. You know, nobody's immune from criticism. Not even Antonella Marty, the you know Argentine libertarian, Cafe Liberal. Um, Aaron, we've got to run. Anything okay. else you want to say before we go? Really briefly. And then the other one is abortion. It's an open debate among libertarians. Let everyone has to accept it. And the We're other not one is start a lot of the abortion thing exactly. right now. Aaron. Where That's can people where can people follow you online? On uh, on uh, on on X on on Twitter, Aaron Sepulveda C. That's where that's where you can find me. And yes, there's a lot to debate. <laughs> All right, got to run, Aaron. Thanks Listen. so much for keeping us updated on what's happening in South America. Keep up the good work. We will make sure to bring you back here again real soon. Have a wonderful week, and we'll talk to you soon. Blessings. There you go, that's Aaron Sepulveda. What do you guys think? Good stuff. Okay. We are seven minutes away from the launch of a brand new show on the Wake Up America network. That is Hustling and Homemaking, Stephanie Peterson's brand new show. You do not want to miss it. Austin, where can I see the new show, Hustling and Homemaking? Really simple. Go to apforlibertyshop.com. It's pinned to the front. You're going to click on the button that says watch it here. It's going to take you to the video. The video is going to go live in, well, a little bit more than five. So six minutes from now brand new show you definitely don't want to miss stephanie's adventures in hustling and homemaking with a first-time pregnancy she's got a little bit of unsolicited advice out there for all of the people who uh she's interacted with since she got pregnant and our little baby girl will be born of course just four months from now her no her new show features her stories balancing pregnancy motherhood homemaking and keeping a career on the side follow along with all her adventures in hustling and homemaking, check that video out, apforlibertyshop.com. And if you enjoy it, like it, share it, 
to all your friends and neighbors. We appreciate y'all very much. We'll see you guys tomorrow on the Wake Up America Show at wakeupamericashow.com. Expanse of time, a year might seem like a mere moment, but oh, what a year it's been. In September 2022, Austin and Stephanie Peterson embarked on a journey, a journey to wake up America. They began humbly, with just 20 souls tuning in, learning, listening, and though challenges arose, like the looming shadow of YouTube demonetization, their spirit never waned. And now, thanks to you, thousands rise with the sun to join them, to listen, to engage, to be a part of a community. So here's to you and to wake up America. For memories shared, for friends made, for the journey ahead, and for never, ever forgetting to rise and freedom. Happy anniversary. I'm Donald Trump and I approve this message. Believe me, Austin Peterson is the best. He's got the greatest Wake Up America show I've ever seen. Whenever I tune in in the mornings and watch the live stream, let me tell you, he has got the absolute best content. I love his guests. It's just a total blast to watch. And I highly endorse and recommend the Wake Up America show. It's terrific. Believe me. Is the outdoor your home about as exciting as a library? Then spice it up and unbore your space with our custom metal signs. Crafted with love and a bit of libertarian magic, you can customize your own metal sign at ap4libertyshop.com. So head to ap4libertyshop.com, customize your own metal sign today. to a world of vocal discovery at Peterson Voice Studio. I'm Justin Peterson, here to guide your musical journey. Envision a place where your voice reaches new heights, where every note tells a story. We embrace all singers, from the enthusiastic shower vocalists to aspiring stars, ensuring each voice finds its unique rhythm and tone. Are you ready to elevate your voice? Visit petersonvoicestudio.com and sign up for remote lessons tailored just for you. Let's begin this melodious journey together. Tired of spending your hard-earned money on woke corporations that don't share your pro-freedom values? Fed up with sipping liberal lattes and progressive cappuccinos? Introducing Founding Flavors from AP for Liberty Shop. Get your day started with Washington's revolutionary roast. As robust and principled as the man himself, this blend is the shot of energy heard round the world. Or maybe you want to taste the fervor of freedom with Adams's patriotic perk. It's as dynamic and balanced as the U.S. Constitution, sure to awaken your spirit of liberty. For the aficionados, we've got the Jeffersonian Java, a complex mix of flavors that speaks volumes about your refined tastes. And don't forget Betsy's Liberty Lullaby, our decaf option. Crafted with the same care and dedication Betsy Ross put into our Star Spangled Banner, this blend lets you enjoy the taste of freedom anytime without losing sleep. No woke beans here, folks. Just pure, patriotic, pro-freedom flavors brewed with love for liberty. So why compromise your principles for a cup of coffee? Stand up for your values, perk up your patriotism, and start your day the American way. Get your founding flavors at apforlibertyshop.com. Um...